Sempre és un plaer compartir casa. Sabeu que l'oficina Creative Europe Media està participada per l'ICEC i per la Comissió Europea a través de la implementació que fa la EACA. Portem molts anys al mercat, en concret 27. Recordo que el primer resultat que va arribar positiu per Catalunya va ser en la temporada 95-96 per les tres bessones de cromosoma. El programa va arrencar el 91 i vam ser la primera oficina, molt abans que Madrid, a tenir antena, que es deia en aquell moment, a Catalunya. A partir d'aquí vam començar a desenvolupar diferents relacions amb la seu del Parlament Europeu i la Comissió Europea de Barcelona en aquesta magnífica aula Europa, amb la meva antecessora, l'Aurora Moreno, que va crear un bon caldo de cultiu de bones relacions amb els seus caps, que hem anat continuant i és el nostre espai habitual per fer una sessió com aquestes. Ja sabeu que nosaltres tenim la marca pròpia, que és hashtag Europe Calls, on expliquem, acostem les convocatòries europees, tant de cultura com de mèdia, al sector on la cultura pot ser depositària finalista, Horizó 2020, Erasmus, etc. Però en algunes sessions que són transversals i que són política europea, ens agrada fer-ho a casa de la Comissió Europea. És per això que el Ferran Terradellas i el seu equip, a qui avui representa el Marc Jeffrey, ens veníem ja a portar molt de temps amb ganes d'aportar d'això que se'n parla molt, però que la gent no acaba de tocar. És a dir, hi ha, com us diria, dos nivells, el nivell de coneixement i el nivell de palabreria, en la qual no saps ben bé què s'està fent amb agenda digital i amb mercat únic digital. Llavors, per fer-vos una mica l'storytelling, com us he fet, de safata que us tanca l'avió i us retrasa l'avió 20 minuts, doncs l'storytelling aquí és el mateix. Jo estava en aquesta situació de no saber molt bé, sentia coses per la part que em toca d'audiovisual, com molts de vosaltres, que aquí ja veig audiència que és 50-50, de l'audiovisual i gent que no, i a Malta, amb una cimera de digital, que després va haver-hi una altra cimera amb un mid-term report que ara veurem a Tallinn, el 28 de setembre, va permetre veure què s'havia fet, el que ja havia llegit, però què s'havia fet amb quant les tres mesures, les tres columnes, les 16 mesures, què s'havia fet, què està en el pipeline, què porten a terme, i què vindrà fins a final del programa i fins i tot què s'estan plantejant pel proper septeni. I és per això que de seguida vam contactar amb la gent que té les competències de la VG Connect i per mi és un plaer tenir el Martin Bailey, que és el cap d'unitat de política digital de la VG Connect. Per tant, és aquella, en un dintre l'organigrama, el que s'encarrega justament de la política digital. Bienvenido, Martin. Sé que hablas como casi todos los europeos varios idiomas, entre ellos el español, pero debido a los tecnicismos, etcétera, etcétera, y además porque tienes un, uh, un discurso claro al respecto de lo que nos vas a presentar hoy. So, um, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so, I will, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you, I think, quite a, a general but thorough look into, into digital and digital strategy in the European Union. Um, I'm sure many of you work in very specific works, uh, areas, even silos, even very, very particular areas. But um, I think it's very important that whatever area you're working in, uh, you have an idea of, of the framework, however boring that framework may be, of everything else that is, that is going on in digital. Um, just to say my expertise, I was one of the persons who, who designed and drafted the framework. I have written some of the legislation, but I have not written all of the legislation at all. Uh, so I'm not an expert on every single aspect. You have to, to realize I will try and answer questions as best as I can. Some I know because I've written the very words of the law, but others I won't, I won't because it's nearly uh, 35 pieces of legislation. So it's a, it's a lot of work. Okay, so, um, so here I go. Um, this is kind of the, the, the schema of the, of the presentation. I'm saying, saying kind of why, the what of the digital single market strategy. I'm going to home in in a few uh, important areas. Then I'm going to talk about this midterm review two years on after the launch of our strategy, our kind of review and where we're looking to go in, in the future. Um, you may or may not know this guy here. This is President uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, the Luxembourger. He's president of the European Commission. 
And what is very new about him is that um, he put the digital single market right at the top of his priorities. And interestingly, it comes, comes just under jobs, growth, and investment. This is something very new for the commission to put digital very, very high up. Almost, this is not hierarchical, but it's significant that it appears in, in the second case of the priorities. Um, the question we asked ourselves is why do you need a digital single market strategy? I think there are, there are two, two important bits. We need, to, we need to make progress in Europe. This is a, a phenomenal source of, of growth and, if you like, welfare and, and change for the positive in Europe. And we have to harness this change. We found that there are, there are two things basically going wrong. There are still uh, many, many barriers, barriers for businesses, barriers for, uh, for, for citizens to get the very best of what is available online and what can be done online. I won't read out these statistics for you. They're fairly, um, they're fairly obvious, but if you look at the one with a picture of the little uh, smartphone there, you look at the size of the e-commerce market. This is buying and selling online. Um, and then you look at the percentage that's being done across Europe. It's very, very small. It's 8%. Um, you also see this point of fragmentation. Um, it's very difficult to do business with 28 or 27 member states across Europe when they all have their separate rules, all have their separate regimes. Um, and this is a world where scale and speed are very, very important. Um, this may also be a reason why the, the American platforms, I'll come to this later, are able to be so successful in Europe because they already have the scale and the speed which they have accumulated or succeeded in achieving in the US. And they come to Europe and they've rolled out a model, whereas we have to uh, try and deal with, with every region, every country, every difference. And that's very difficult for a small company or even a large company uh, to succeed. And at the bottom I've set out here, this is, this is a massive market in Europe. There's 500 uh, million consumers. Um, we want to create an environment where our own businesses can prosper and crucially to, to scale up. Um, that's just a few, a few facts and figures here. This is from, uh, from last year. I think it's already, already outdated. It shows uh, type of services we're accessing online. Um, how we're using news, how we're getting to news. I think these figures are probably quite different now. I understand in the, in the Italian referendum uh, end, of, end of last year, over 50% of the voters or the would-be voters got their news from Facebook, not from traditional media, but from, from Facebook. You can draw your own conclusions there. Um, this slide, I think, is, is fairly useful to show you really at a glance how the world is changing. Um, it speaks for itself. You have the, the giants of, of oil and supermarkets and energy, General Electric there, then in 2001, the biggest company in the world. Um, and then you zoom forward to today and you see it's the gaffers plus Amazon. Gaffers what we, is the short form for Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. Um, so that, I think, is a, is a good sort of example to see how our, our world is, is transforming in terms of uh, size and market power, and, and we shouldn't be naive to that. Um, so there was enough rationale for us to, to put together a single market strategy. If we in Europe are not acting in a collective fashion, then it is going to be very difficult to leverage and take the benefit uh, of, of all the advantages and the opportunities that a coherent, uh, easy, seamless framework of rules can, can, can offer. Um, so we had, and I'll keep this fairly brief, we divided the strategy into three main building blocks. One, access for consumers and citizens. Two, creating the right environment, creating, creating the same uh, creating a, 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 a coherent set of rules and framework um, so businesses and services can, can pro and service providers can, can succeed. And thirdly, um, and I think it's, this is rather a, a, a combination of pillar one and pillar two, is, 
is maximizing the potential for growth in the digital economy. Um, the way we see it, if you don't have pillar one and pillar two, then you're not even in the game. Um, most US successful platforms are way into pillar three. Um, they have really understood how to maximize uh, growth from, from data. And this is the area where we need to be fighting and this is the area where we need to be competing in. Um, so I have put in very brief form where the various legislative uh, components fit under the, the pillars, and I'm going to go into, into some of these a bit later. I mean, you can see that there's harmonization rules for doing easier business, there's more efforts to create infrastructure, to promote our own content, ensuring trust and security. Without trust and security, there is nothing in the digital age. People won't go online, people won't buy stuff, people won't sell stuff. This is an absolutely crucial underpinning for, uh, for the digital single market. I give you there a bit of a timeline. We launched the digital single market strategy in May 2015. We had our review, which I'll talk about a bit later in, um, in, uh, in May of this year, and my unit um, wrote, the, wrote the review. And, um, and then this, this, this deadline for implementation that was set out in, by the European Council a few weeks ago, that they want all these measures to be agreed upon uh, through the course of next year. Just show where are we now, how much there is. Um, there, were, there are 16 key block actions, 43 proposals, 24 of them are legislative. Um, you can all read, so I won't, I won't read them out for you. Um, clearly a big win that you, that you feel. Uh, well, I'm not sure how much you travel around, but, uh, but roaming has made our lives considerably, considerably easier. It was, um, don't forget though, that this is also a big loss for the telecoms providers. Um, it's very useful for us as consumers, but they face significant losses of paying for the data uses, particularly those member states uh, that have already very, very low, um, low kind of monthly subscriptions to pay. When they go and roam in, 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 say, Western Europe or larger regions of Europe, they're having to pay those costs to the bigger providers. So um, it's, don't forget, this is quite a cost to the telecoms uh, providers who are having to invest all the time. They're making the biggest infrastructure investment in Europe. This is in the order of 800 billion euros to invest in the fiber optic, to invest in the infrastructure, which we kind of take for granted, or certainly um, I do when I download all my, all, all my media content. Um, portability of content, I'll come on to that, but this is useful when you have your subscription, you go abroad and you can see your, your whatever subscription, Netflix or news when, when you travel. This is the real geeky, nerdy part. This is the release of 700 megahertz. This is the band, this is the part of the spectrum that uh, this is needed for 5G, or fifth generation. So all these value-added services that we talk about in, in health and data, et cetera, do need to operate on the, five, on the 700 megahertz spectrum. Um, just as the Marrakesh, and you may or may not be aware, but this is for people uh, with visual impairment. We mustn't forget those we kind of leave behind or leave aside uh, when, we, when we're working with the internet. There must be provisions to ensure that they have access to the content. And Wi-Fi for Europe, you've probably heard about. Um, this is setting up hotspots in Europe where the European Union will, maybe in a small, a small village, a small town, the European Union will pay the capital cost of setting up this, this um, free Wi-Fi space, but it's for the local community to pay for the ongoing operating costs. Um, there are other bits, it's not just laws, um, where the, which, which, is, uh, which form part of our strategy. Um, I'll very briefly talk about e-government, cyber, uh, skills, absolutely crucial. Um, connectivity, I'll talk briefly about connectivity. And probably one of the most important things is digitizing the European industry. Digitizing European, digitizing industry is not just making your, 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 your workplace more effective by using computers or by making it, the process faster. This is all about gathering the data, using the data, uh, exploiting the data, finding the value add from the data. Very often the successful US companies uh, start off, their business model starts with the data, they have the data. 
how are we going to use the data, how will we add value to the data. And often in Europe, this is a personal reflection, we start from the other way around. We say, oh, we have our nice industry, we've been doing the same thing for 50 years, let's add a bit of data. Um, think of the Tesla car, for example, how they started with the data, then made the cars, and they've been a disruptor in, in the car market so far, so far. Um, so I'm going to look briefly into a few policy proposals. Um, I s mentioned quickly about um, connectivity. Um, you can see, I mean, most, if you go to any city in, in Europe, really, I don't think I've been to one where there's no decent internet, but you start driving out to the countryside and, um, and it starts getting, uh, starts to deteriorate. Um, clearly, this is not helpful for people work, uh, working and living in the rural or, or non-metropolitan areas. How can they get into the digital age if they have a very slow internet, internet connection? How can they really contribute to or benefit from the value-added services that digital can provide. This is a slide I can share with you. Um, so briefly then, we've, we've set this framework for telecommunications in order to ensure that there's better connectivity across, across Europe. Um, on the legal side, there's a new telecoms code. That means a rule book, which is essentially probably doesn't affect anybody in this room, but it, um, it's yeah, your A to Z of, of, um, of telecommunications rules. Uh, we've set up a pro-investment environment. Um, we want more coordination of spectrum, spectrum, uh, i.e. between the member states. When you uh, launch the tenders, how long the calls for tenders, well, sorry, how long the licenses, the duration of the licenses, how long the licenses will be. We've built in a very strong consumer protection part for example, when you can end your contract, when you can change provider. I've talked about Wi-Fi for Europe, and we've set out an action plan for, for 5G. I'm going through this a bit quickly because it's quite heavy, but if you look at the kind of strategic objectives, uh, clearly we're going to have, uh, I, I would suggest there's still going to be a difference between the metropolitan areas and the rural areas, but we want every, uh, every household in Europe, wherever they are, to have a minimum internet connection of 100 megabits per second, so that's quite a good bandwidth speed. But clearly, in, in there, will, there will be those metropolitan areas in, or, or, the met, or the big cities in, in, in Europe. We want at least each major city, major city to have access to a 5G, so the, kind of the mega, mega connection for internet. Um, one of the other objectives was unlocking the potential of, of European commerce in Europe. Um, so this is basically buying and selling across border. We found there were a lot of barriers. Uh, there was a lot of fragmentation, a lot of differences in the rules. Um, I will give you an example of, of, of going into geoblocking, which is a piece of legislation which, uh, which I worked on. Um, you can see there's the various elements. How do we better protect consumers? Um, how do we make the rules easier for companies? Um, how do we make kind of the, 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 the actual transit of the goods more affordable? And how do we tackle geo-blocking? Um, I'll just show you one aspect here which sort of slips at the bottom of the slide there. That's harmonization of digital contracts rules. Um, this represents a cost for companies when they want to sell uh, across borders and they have to come to terms with different contractual rules, different standards in another member state. And that's the reason why, at least they've told us, they don't, do not sell across borders. Because essentially, uh, they have to spend around 9,000 euros per member state to find out what the law is, how can we, how can we uh, comply with it. Now, times that by, by 28 or 27 member states, this is a considerable cost for a small company. Um, so one of the projects we've been working on, one of the legal initiatives, is to try and harmonize some basic contractual rules, things like guarantees. So you have a product where I think in, in Sweden or Denmark, the guarantee is nine years. In other parts of Europe, it's three years. So how are you going to, to agree on, on those standards? Well, we're trying to harmonize those now. It's proving very, very difficult, of course, as each member state wants to impose their standards. But the, the overall message is to the member states, the reason for our initiative is that if we do not have a harmonization of these standards, then it's going to be very difficult for our own 
enterprises to grow. So essentially, what we're trying to bring down is the cost of compliance with legal regimes in the member states for companies wanting to do business abroad. Um, just on parcel delivery, so packages in the post, we're not doing any price regulation. A lot of people think we're regulating the prices. We're not. We are, at the moment, uh, creating an environment of transparency. So people see or business can see how much it costs uh, to, to, to send the parcel through. You can see the discrepancy here, the different costs between the member states to, um, to send the two kilogram parcel. You see Spain is, is fairly high there. Um, I'm not sure if you know what geoblocking is. Um, geoblocking, you may or may not have encountered it yourself. You try to buy a good or service abroad and either your credit card doesn't work or when you enter in your, your, your uh, email address, if your IP address uh, or finally when you can't, can't pay, uh, you, you get refused delivery or you get refused access. And we think there's a big difference between, uh, which should not be justified, between the physical world and the, um, and, and, the, uh, and the virtual world. It's almost like, you know, if, you're, if you go into Zara here, you want to buy something in, in Spain and you show your Belgian passport and they say, sorry, you've, um, you've got to go back to Belgium and buy your good in Belgium. This is effectively what can happen in the virtual world. If you try and buy something from Zara here and you're in Belgium, you will get sent back, what we call rerouted, back to the Belgium store, which is obviously more expensive. And this is the sort of thing that we're, we are trying to, to, to tackle. It's not a, an attack on Zara, but that's just, that's just a, an example. Um, so I will, what we're trying to end is what we call unjustified uh, geo-blocking. But I'll just whiz through in case it's, it takes too long. Um, so what we are targeting in the regulation, we want to end this sort of, uh, this, this geo-blocking on the basis of a kind of discrimination. Um, we're saying that you, know, you cannot uh, not sell to somebody because he or she is in another member state or they have another nationality. Um, so for example, if it's an Italian uh, bike producer, they make these very flashy racing bikes, yeah, I think in the north of Italy, and if they only make 26 a year, um, they can say, well, I only sell to professional cyclists I, because it's a reputational thing, not somebody, I don't know, some kind of Russian oligarch. Whatever the price, they're not going to sell to the person. It's a reputational thing. But if they say you cannot have the bike because you're Spanish or you're French or you're Catalan, that is not justified. But there can be other reasons for the justification. Or if they say we only make 26 handmade bikes a year, we're not going to increase our stock to, to sell anymore. Um, so... What we want to remove is, accept, is, is the discrimination based on nationality or on residence for buying physical goods, for access to electronic services like cloud and hosting and things like concert tickets, car rental, hotels. You may, when you travel across Europe, find that because you're Spanish or because you're French, you pay a, a special local price, whereas the locals pay a lower price. This is the kind of discrimination we're trying to abolish. We want you to be able to access any website you want and that you are not rerouted to your national website unless you agree to it. And also to stop the discrimination in the payments. Um, uh, if, for example, they already offer visa, we're not gonna force a company to offer visa, but if they already offer visa, uh, they can't say, well, I only take a Spanish visa or a French visa, no. Um, they will have to accept visa. They will have to take, accept the type of card you have. But there are various safeguards on authentication, which the seller can ask for, um, so that uh, the seller is fully protected from, from fraud. Um, a few things to be clear. We're not regulating the prices. We're not telling the companies what prices they may charge. You can still have differences between the member states. People can still shop around. We're not obliging people to sell. This is very important to understand. We're not saying you must sell, but we're saying when you sell, you cannot make a difference between a French and a German, etc. cetera. Um, so very briefly on, on, on copyright. Um, uh, let me just look at my own slides while I am here. So there was quite a, a substantial package that we, that we uh, launched last year 
Uh, I think it's about seven or eight uh, directives and, and, and regulations. Basically, through the whole package, what we're trying to do is to create more, more fairness in the market, um, particularly in, for example, you may, you may be aware of this term called the, the value gap. Uh, a lot of publishers or, or producers or media content providers feel that they're, it's, it's unfair, um, that the relationship between them and the large online platforms is unfair. They're not getting the value for money. Their content is being contributed for free. Uh, we've tried to put in place some rules to, to inject uh, greater fairness into that relationship. At the same time, um, we are also trying to uh, free up and encourage uh, the sharing of content across borders. We're trying to make it easier for the broadcasters uh, to get the right to the other content uh, across Europe so that uh, consumers, viewers can leg legitimately get hold of the, the films and other media content across the borders. Um, and th th those, I think, are the, are the kind of the main underpinnings. We also want to make uh, available more material to, to research and education uh, foundations and communities uh, who, who, will need the, who will need the data, who will need the content to properly carry out their, their research. Um, I think I touched on at the beginning the portability of online content services. So as of yeah, 1st of April next year, Europeans will be able to take their subscription with them when they go traveling. Uh, this does not mean that when you are in France, you can buy the content in, in, in Spain, unless Spain is already, or the particular company is making it available. But it means that the, the French man or woman can take his his or her content, take a subscription when they go to Spain. Um, this is compulsory for the, for the paid for services, but um, the free services or the public services can opt in, which means, for example, like the BBC in the UK, they can opt in to allow you to travel with the, with the iPlayer or, or, or an equivalent. Um, we've also set out in, this was back in 2016, uh, we have a new AVMSD, the Audiovisual Media Framework. Um, it's, it was a fairly complicated package. Um, what we have increased is the independent role for the, um, for the audiovisual regulators in Europe. We've given them stronger powers, more independence, uh, stronger powers for them to intervene in the market. The most important, I think, has been the balancing out between the traditional um, broadcasters and the, the on, what we call the online video sharing platforms, that they are subject to the same uh, obligations, in particular for guarding against hate speech for everybody and harmful content for minors. So we've made a, uh, a balancing act, if you want, among the, 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 the providers. Um, we've also made this, this country of origin principle, so we've made it easier to apply so that um, a given authority or even a, a complainant can know which provider is subject to which jurisdiction. And we're creating a database for this, so you know that the Spanish provider in Luxembourg uh, is actually subject to the Spanish regulator or perhaps another regulator if, it, if it's established in two member states. So we've made that easier to find out where where the jurisdiction lies. Um, we're also increasing the support and access to European works. It was one part of the, um, of the directive that was not very popular with the online platforms. And this was the minimum content of 20%. They must have a minimum of 20% European content. You may agree or disagree with that amount. Uh, the platforms did not like it, I would have to say. Um, so those are a, f a few of the provisions that we, a few of the bits of law that we have been, um, that we have introduced over the last two years. I'm going to talk briefly about the, the stock taking exercise that we conducted in May. We worked out where we are, where are we going. Um, so in May of this year, we've, we've looked at where we are in the legislation, uh, what still needs to be achieved, what the, what the aims are, do we need to renew the aims, do we need to em emphasize um, new things. The, that was 
one part of the of this of this review. It's it's a, sort of a 25-page commission communication followed by a staff working document where we go into a lot of details. And if you're interested in your your sector to see what's happened, you can freely freely access the staff working document where you will find a lot of detail. But perhaps the most important part of this communication um, is basically the future agenda, what we're looking at to be doing in the future. Um, we identified two major challenges. Uh, one is easier than, than the other, at least in identifying it. The first one is the digital environment of the future. It has to be fair, open, and secure. And we identified three elements of this that we either need to Im improve or, or protect or take measures for. Um, what was slightly easy about this is the secure digital environment is that we, we, were, I, we were available, we were able to identify them in particular. So looking at the online platforms, the fairness of the online platforms, I will go into this, this is very important. The data economy, what we need to do in Europe to get the data economy flowing. How do we literally free up the flow of data? And finally, how do we make it secure? As you go on in the document, the challenges become more difficult, because they become less defined, if you will. And this is really when we have the fundamental building blocks in place, how are we going to take full advantage of it? And this is managing the digital transformation. This is the part really where I think we're weakest in Europe, where we don't have the, the infrastructure, where we don't have the instinct, where many of our, almost all of our traditional industries uh, don't want or are not able to fully embrace the digital age. And so we, we, we homed in, we focused in on a few of these aspects where in Europe we, we need to improve or where the advantages are. The key thing is this, is that one of the things we, we've, we've kind of realized, you know, we're not going to become Amazon, we're not going to become Facebook, we're not going to become Google. So often people say, why don't we have a, uh, a European Google? There are many reasons why we don't have the European Google. We've never invested in the algorithm technology which the Americans have been working on for the last 40, 50 years. The Americans have put a huge amount of budget uh, into the state budget. Uh, it's often through the defense budget, but through the defense budget, through the science budget, they develop the technology which is then used in other businesses. As you probably know, in Europe, uh, technology and science comes very, very low down the list in budget expenditure. We're always fighting with structural funds or, or agriculture, and the share of budget that is used for research and development is very, very small in in the US, you often find when in Europe it's decreasing it. We actually decreased our budget in, uh, into research at the last uh, multi-annual framework, the last European budget. We decreased the budget into research and technology, uh, whereas the Americans add hundreds of billions. So that's also a question we need to ask ourselves in, in, in Europe. Um, but we have our strengths in Europe. We're very strong in, in our health sector. We're very strong in our mobility sector. We're very strong in fintech. And we feel that if we want to really make progress in Europe, we need to basically try and, and pull on our assets, pull on our strengths, and convert those, digitize those, where we really have the, have the advantage. I mean, you're probably aware our health sector in U Europe is universally far superior to what they have in, in, in the US with its, with its huge discrepancies uh, across the country. Uh, we have very good transport net, uh, networks. We have a very strong media sector sector, et cetera, et cetera. I'll go into some of the details there. And of course, we talked about the, the international dimension. The European Union must also look out, must think about how we project our values, project our practices, project our regulatory frameworks. So it's not just uh, what we call a navel gazing exercise. Um, digital skills, this kind of you know, speaks for itself. There's a massive need for digital skills all across Europe. We don't have people who are sufficiently skilled either entering the job market or coming into the, uh, sorry, or already in the job market. This, however, I must point out, is a competence for the member states. The European Union has no powers whatsoever in education or training. Uh, if you like, we can offer suggestions, we can fund the programs, but this is essentially for the member states. If they want to, or if you want to bring your your, your generation of existing workers or new workers 
or, or, or children in schools, if you want to bring their d digital skills up to a minimum level of literacy and numeracy. I mean, one of the measures we're looking at at the moment is how to tackle fake news in the longer term. One of the things we must work on is the media literacy, how media literacy online, how people can, can recognize uh, what is perhaps either fake content or the source of the, the news or what's looking a bit dodgy or how have you come across this, um, this bit of news in your Facebook feed. Um, we, ne we need to teach people to differentiate kind of the, I don't want to say the good or the bad, but the, the high and the low quality. This is a huge exercise. One small thing, you may, may be aware of the Erasmus program where we offer opportunities to uh, students to study abroad. We want to extend this now on a, on a digital, to a digital sort of wavelength to allow people to, uh, to allow graduates to get experience in digital areas through, through internships. So you may, for example, work in the digital analytics department of Siemens or BMW uh, if you're working in Spain, and, and we actually fund this program. And the aim is to launch it next year. Um, E-government, I'll say this briefly. Um, I think what the, the circle we're trying to square here is to match up the, the level of expectation between what citizens feel in, in the private sector, what they experience in the private sector, and level that up with what they should be getting in the public sector. Maybe in your own countries, it takes a very long time to get hold of a document to stand in queues, whereas if you need to uh, buy something from Amazon uh, or you know, a food, a food supply, you click on the mouse, and in 20 minutes, it's on your doorstep or it's in your office the next day. But in the, in the public sector, uh, there's a huge discrepancy. It can be hours and it can be uh, days. And, and this is essentially we're launching uh, well, we've launched an action plan last year to try and encourage uh, local administrations, national administrations to become more digitized, to offer more services online for immediate uh, delivery. Digitizing European industry, this is obviously one of the greatest challenges for Europe because we are very, very strong in industry. We're very strong at the moment. We're very strong in pharmaceuticals. We're very, very strong in, um, in mobility, in car manufacture in a lot of kind of raw manufacture, high level engineering, but we need to get to the next level and ensure that we are uh, fully up to speed in terms of data analytics, sensor, big data, um, high performance computing so that we can uh, generate and, and use and extract the value from data in order to provide hugely added value to our goods and services. Um, you may think, think of things like, uh, uh, not just cars and connected cars driving around Europe, but also, so, you know, when your car is an automated car or very, very advanced GPS, but also things like hospitals, bridges, infrastructure, uh, public housing, so that in our view, or as many studies have shown, it is cheaper that uh, a computer or sensors can diagnose one or two years in advance when the part of a rail line is beginning to deteriorate or a bridge is beginning to collapse, it's better that you repair it in advance or in the worst case scenario, you avert a national disaster. And technology uh, can provide those means and can ensure that it will identify a weakness in the structure, the infrastructure provider is alerted to it, can come in, can repair it, and, diagon and once diagnosed, can resolve the situation um, quickly. This is critical to maintenance of our, of our critical infrastructures across Europe. Obviously, when it comes to energy and nuclear power, this is even more, even more critical. Um, digital health, we, we carried out a survey last year, and we found that over half of European citizens that we, that we interviewed would like to have access to their health records across border. So, for example, if you're in Spain and you have uh, an accident in Lithuania, and you don't speak Lithuanian, then uh, the doctors can have access to your, to your health records in Spain, and, uh, and they will be able to know what you're allergic to, what your conditions have been, and you don't have to explain it. Um, of course, again, um, health is, is a national competence, so in Europe we have to be very careful, we have no powers, but what we can do in Europe is encourage greater cooperation between the national, the national authorities, between the uh, hospitals, we can provide the framework. 
clearly one of the, the big advantages. If we can amalgamate the, amalgamate the health data, we can better diagnose, we can better identify, we can better cure, um, particularly the, the chronic diseases, particularly the, the rare diseases, um, if we are working on large amounts of data. So if health authorities are able to share data, of course, par uh, patients must consent to, to the use of their data under what we call the General Data Protection Regulation, very strict set of rules. But if patients can be persuaded to share their data, then um, the doctors, the health authorities can use this data, um, analyze the data, and be in a better position to cure and diagnose and come up with um, new, new, uh, new, new solutions to whatever the medical problem may be. There's something here about high performance computing, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention that. Um, we also need, as I mentioned before, we need to, to invest in our infrastructure. Probably one thing that's not very well known by, by people in this audience is the need to invest in high performance computing. If you want to get the best out of the, the data economy, it's not just about getting the data, it's your ability to analyze the data. And the ability to analyze the data is wholly determined by the power of the computer processing. You may be surprised to know that the best, most powerful computers in the world are all in the United States. What we want in Europe to do is to develop our own high-powered computing infrastructure. Why? Well, A, so that we can compete commercially, and B, if we are starting to analyze such things as sensitive as health data, most people in Europe will probably want their health data to be analyzed in Europe, in their member state, or at least in the European Union, rather than having their health data being analyzed across borders, be it in China, be it in Japan, uh, be, it, be it in the US. So we feel it is essential that we inject the money uh, and we, we build these machines, if you like, at a European level. And no member state alone, possibly Germany, but it's, it's unlikely that any member state will be able to develop or afford this high power computing capacity equivalent to what they have in the, in the United States. Briefly on unlocking the data economy, um, it's a prerequisite for the success of, of data economy that data can flow. Um, uh, a lot of businesses have found that member states keep their data and they don't want to release their data. If you are uh, being a European developer of, um, you're an app developer for say a, a traffic app and you are Spanish and you want to get hold of it in Germany. Currently there are restrictions in Germany, for example, on access to traffic data. They may say, well, you know, this is potentially a source of terrorism. Terrorists get hold of our traffic data. They know how to plan a terrorist attack. Um, so we understand, on the other hand, the concerns of the member states. So what we've done, we've said, look, right, you must remove these restrictions on, on, on data, on the storage of data locally in your member states. But they are subject to various controls. If it's a matter of public security, public safety, safety you can keep that data. If, for example, if it's crucial health data or location of something to do with critical infrastructure, uh, that, may be, that may count as a justification of national security. Um, the member states didn't want this provision. They wanted to keep their, uh, their local restrictions on data. But we managed to win them over by saying that, look, you can have back the data for regulated control. For example, for tax purposes, fiscal purposes, other financial purposes. If they want access to that data, that's already flowed into another member state, they can get it back. Um, but it was very, very important that we give legal certainty for businesses. Many large businesses said, oh, we don't need this. We can negotiate with the member states. But not every company is big enough to be able to negotiate with the member states, with the national authorities. If you're a small business, it's uh, you, you a man and a dog, you're not going to have, you're not going to be able to walk into a national administration and demand access to that data. So this, this very important piece of legislation, important in our view, gives access to that data that otherwise would have to stay in, in the member state. Um, boosting cybersecurity, needless to say, uh, cyber is a massive threat uh, to, to, our, to our daily lives. Imagine I mean, technology is not yet that advanced, but you can imagine when you have your, your connected car, you have a car, it totally runs on the internet, and you cannot start the car in the morning because there's a cyber attack, there's a ransomware attack. You try to start the car, and the particular virus asks for 
10,000 euros in order to start your car. This is quite a hassle going to, to work every day. But there are more serious things than this still. In the UK, early in the year, there was an attack on, on, on hospitals, on the National Health Service. And it kind of closed down the hospitals quite worryingly um, for, for a day or a lot of the services. And, but actually, this was not an attack on the data. This was just another ransomware attack. You can imagine when the, the cyber hackers, and there are many cyber hackers across the world, uh, when they begin to attack the data, they get into the data. So this would be disastrous, not only for the patients in the hospitals, but also for the acceptance of data in digital. I, one may suppose that if there is a data attack of a major hospital or other infrastructure in Europe, people will want to go back to pen and paper rather than to advance further in the digital world. It's this, this whole framework that we've set up is about ensuring trust and security. You lose the trust, uh, we, we, go back 10, we go back 10 paces. It's almost like the image I like to use is, 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 is the bull in the china shop that, um, and sometimes when I speak to companies and they say, well, you know, you're, you're taking too many preventive measures in Europe. Well, it's a bit like the bull in the china shop. It's a bit like the flea in the ear of the bull. Um, the flea, the flea is the public. Um, if, there is pub, if there is distrust among the public, they are the flea that gets in the ear of the bull, and the bull is the politicians, the political, the political sphere. Um, and they will then, if the bull is irate, then the bull will, will, will destroy the china shop. So we have to ensure that the flea doesn't get into the ear, i.e. the flea, the public. We have to ensure that that flea doesn't get into the bull to destroy the china shop because we will all suffer if, if the china shop is, is destroyed. And that's a metaphor I kind of use to businesses to say, you will have to accept greater controls, you have to accept greater regulation, because if there is that distrust in the public, there's no going back. Um, and you have lost your business, and we have closed down opportunities in Europe. So we've set up, I mean, this is, I think you can read this for yourself, we, we've got a, we set out um, a framework for greater cyber protection Europe certification, saying, showing, showing that a particular good or service has a particular minimum standard. And if you buy that good or service, you know that it's cyber protected. We have uh, beefed up, we've strengthened the agency, the, this EMISA agency, essentially the cyber security agency. And we've also set out what we call a blueprint or kind of a framework for how member states can work in a coordinated fashion uh, in the face of large cyber security attacks. Note with this as well, cybersecurity is a national competence. So it's, there is a limit to what the European Union can do. Um, maybe I've been talking about them quite a lot, so I'll just say one or two words on online platforms. Um, and I don't know how we're doing with time. I'll probably end it here, or I can go further. Um, still, uh, you're still, you're still, still time. I don't want to kind of kill people with all my words. So. Um, this is clearly a very important area, um, and it's, um, it's online platforms. And I think probably three or four years ago, people were looking at the symbols and trying to identify. I'm sure there's nobody in this room who cannot identify every single one of these. Um, but clearly, there are very different types of online platforms. When we speak to the online platforms, the first thing they say is, we're not an online platform, we're an app store, or we're just a content provider. But in our view, these things are all platforms. Um, Clearly, in the modern internet world, um, these large platforms can act as gatekeepers, gatekeepers for businesses, gatekeepers for, 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 for information, gatekeepers to, to consumers. Um, they also have very, very powerful relationships vis-a-vis uh, -vis the suppliers. Now, most people in the room may or not be, may, may I say, merely consumers. Um, and we all have wonderful services from the online platforms. We've discovered through um, a series of, of very detailed investigations that one of the most critical aspects of online platforms is their, is their relationship with suppliers. So whether you are a hotel and you're working with Booking.com or working with TripAdvisor, whether you are an app provider and you are working with Apple, whether you're Spotify and you're working with Apple, uh, whether you're a supplier of shoes or goods and you're supplying to Amazon. 
uh, where you are, whether you're an advertiser and you're working with Google or you're working with Facebook. Uh, and I'll give you an example of a Spanish case of this at the end. Um, these are critical relationships, and we have discovered through our inquiries the platforms have a phenomenal power over the suppliers. They are hundreds of thousand times uh, more powerful. So two years ago when we, when we were um, reviewing the digital single market, we said there is this phenomenon of platforms and we have to look into it. So in May 2000 years ago, uh, two years ago, 2000 years ago, two years ago, we, we, um, we launched the DSM strategy and we said we will be looking at online platforms. We conducted a public consultation. Uh, we had uh, 10,000 responses. There were a number of public consultations across Europe, but one part was platforms. We held a number of stakeholder workshops. It was my unit running this, this particular file. We spoke to professors from across Europe, from MIT, from Harvard. We really got hold of the best people. We conducted and paid for a number of studies. Joint Research Center uh, conducted a very thorough and expensive study into online platforms. We had a Eurobarometer asking businesses, asking consumers how they interact with platforms. And uh, in May of, of last year, we, we published our communication on platforms, again with a staff working document. And then um, I, I will speak a little bit about that. And then we had this midterm review, as I've talked about in, in May of this year, where, we, where we've outlined the actions we are going to take as regards platforms. Um, and then I'll say there's a, a communication on online content. I will just um, talk about that. Um, so we, had this, we conducted this comprehensive assessment of online platforms follow, following the launch of the digital single market strategy. Our overall conclusion was that platforms are, are hugely beneficial. They, they offer huge benefits to consumers, to businesses. They connect up businesses with consumers. They can bring down costs, 75% um, reduction for recruitment costs for employees, things like LinkedIn, et cetera. Probably the recruitment agents are not so happy about that. But certainly, they can bring down costs for many businesses and open up the opportunities to huge, huge markets which hitherto, which until now, have been, have been closed. Identified um, a number of problems. I'm just skipping to the slides so, so you see the flip side of the coin. Um, we focused on, on, on one particular aspect, which I've just talked about, is the relationships between the platforms and the suppliers. Um, and we found that there was a huge frequency of, uh, of problems, of recurrent problems, which businesses uh, signaled to us. We conducted four major workshops, hundreds of meetings, 3,500 businesses responded to us in a survey, and we did 50 interviews. And that we conducted in the last six or seven months. Um, and businesses came back to us with, with, uh, um, with examples of problems that keep coming back, keep coming back. If you have a problem with an online platform and they don't like what you're doing, they can delist you, um, which you can imagine for, um, for a company that's wholly reliant on the internet, this is a bit of a problem. Um, they discriminate, so they treat um, either some of the customers, i.e. the businesses, better or worse than others, or they prefer their own services. Um, you can think of, for example, uh, where there are competing services. Does Apple, question mark, treat its own um, music streaming service in the same way as it treats Spotify, which you may know is also on the, on, on the, uh, Apple, iOS, on the Apple App Store? Um, are they being transparent? Are they giving access to the data? So if your hotel is booking.com giving the data about your hotel, all the extra data it has about your hotel that you don't have, is it sharing that with you? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The biggest problem which um, businesses signaled to us was the, the lack of effective address. If they have a problem with a large platform, they either get a blank email, uh, thank you for your complaint, we're looking into this, or there's no response at all. And what do they do? Well, the only thing you can do at the moment is to take them to court in the US, which you can imagine for a small business is rather expensive. If you have to go to California, Californian um, jurisdiction, Californian applicable law. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of, a lot of money. I'm gonna give one example of this, um, 
mon horchacha, and it's very bad um, pronunciation. But this this drink in Valencia, which I'm sure you've all tasted, it it looks disgusting, but I'm I'm sure it's very very tasty. Um, so what happened was that um, so you are horchatera, as you probably know, this is sold both physically. You can actually buy this stuff online as well. So this seller had both an online presence and a physical presence. And for some reason or other, Facebook delisted them. Now, Orchatera or Chacha did all its marketing or a large part of its marketing via Facebook. And once Facebook took them off the site, they lost 36% of their sales. Um, obviously, Orchata was not happy with this, and it tried to sue Facebook in the Spanish courts. Why? Because it could not afford to take them to court to bring proceedings in the US. And the Spanish courts, I think it's the, the courts of Valencia of the region, decided that um, on the basis of actually consumer legislation, because there's no business to business legislation in Spain, as I understand it, they said that this will have such an impact on consumers that we, the courts, the Spanish courts, have the right to intervene. And after four months of proceedings, the Spanish court concluded that the, the trial can be decided on the substance, um, on the actual content of the case, uh, that, the, that the case can be tried in Spain. But that took four months just to establish the jurisdiction. Now, um, Orchacha is lucky in a way because it has a physical, not only an online presence. Sh surely, I mean, certainly its, its, its sales were damaged by the removal of the online presence, but it wasn't destroyed. You can imagine if you are uh, an app developer or an app provider, and either uh, Apple or, or Google, for whatever reason, decides to cut you off, you are dead. Your company does not exist anymore. Uh, even for a hotel, if you think about it, if you, you guys probably can name many, many hotels uh, around Barcelona, but you probably can't name many in, in Tallinn or in Cunio or in Windsor. So most people now, when they're looking for a hotel, go to some online platform to get access to find it. So if you're a hotel, without that access, without that what used to be a guidebook or a Michelin guide, without access to that, probably your business is not going to survive for very long on the basis of just passing or, or local trade. We, by the beginning of next year, we are going to come up with most likely legislation to try and undress some unfairness in the relationship between platforms and suppliers. So this is platform to business. This is not consumer. There are protections for, for consumers. I can kind of go into that if you want. Um, so we're trying to tackle these unfair clauses. They're unfair clauses not only that you'll be delisted for no reason, they can change their terms and conditions without notice. They can also set a minimum price, like online bookings say you cannot charge below the price we set online. So even if you're a regular customer who goes to a hotel 20 times a year, they cannot sell to you lower than you have online. And the, the, the little hotel will say, or the big hotel, well, you know, I need to have flexibility in my business. And then the online provider will say, well, we give you access to the whole world. So quid pro quo is you accept our terms and conditions. Um, so we'll be coming up with probably legislation that's not decided as we're going through an impact assessment now. This is to go through all the options, to check them economically and legally, to see if they are sound, to see if they work. Coming up with rules to ensure greater fairness in, in the market as regards this, as we say, alleged unfair conduct. We also are looking into ways to uh, solve disputes between platforms and pl between suppliers uh, in... in um, in a more fair way. Now, this may or may not affect the people in this room, but sooner or later, you're either all going to be on the platform or you're going to be a platform yourself. So you'll probably at some point have an interaction with the, with the larger online platforms. So for us, this is a very uh, critical initiative. Um, we're the first in, in the world in terms of, um, of regulators, uh, international regulators, to, to look into this problem to take on the massive issue of online platforms, given uh, when you saw my first slide, their, their huge um, economic importance and significance in the modern world. There's, just to say that there are a number of other rules to which online platforms are subject to 
in the, in the European Union. Of course, we have our competition policy, our competition rules. But as you may or may not know, it's, you have to prove dominance. You have to prove dominance that, that, that a particular platform is, in, is the dominant player, is the biggest player in the market. It's very difficult to prove this. Why? Because the platforms do actually compete against themselves. Um, Apple and Google and Facebook, they all compete very, very hard, uh, very often for the same market. So there's no question of collusion. There's no question of a cartel. But because they all kind of share out the market, in, in few cases are they dominant. We found that Google is dominant in search. Google is, is, um, is dominant in its own downstream um, uh, online shopping services and prefers its own services, directs people to its own services over competitors. Um, but it's very, very difficult to prove. But that doesn't mean that there's not a problem. And where we cannot solve the problems via competition rules, we have to look at other solutions. I'll come on to a bit about intermediary liability. There are lots of rules as well to protect consumers online. We have the e-privacy directive. Uh, we have the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation for um, protection of your, um, of your personal data. And there's also something called the uh, Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, which is also applicable to platforms if you're a trader, um, which protects um, citizens again, or, or consumers online where there's, there's a case of, of misleading behavior when you're told. I mean, for example, you may think of on the, the booking sites, it used to say only one room left. Now it has to say only one room left on this site. They've had to correct that because you, you're induced to buying that. That's just one, one example of unfairness, which our rules are now uh, beginning, to, beginning to tackle. Um, dun -dun. The other big aspect is uh, removal of online, dun -dun. removal of, of illegal content online. Um, so in terms of, um, in, in terms of where we are in the initiatives, um, there was a letter shortly around the, well, it was around the time of the, the digital summit in Tallinn earlier this year that we need to take more action to detect illegal content online, to detect um, and take down dangerous content. There's a lot of rules already, uh, particularly under the e-commerce directive, particularly under the, the copyright package, um, to take down illegal content as regards infringement of copyright. But the rules are rather weaker uh, for taking down uh, material which incites hatred, violence, and terrorism. Uh, needless to say, given a lot of the, the, the terrorist attacks, which at some point have uh, been traced to activity online, exchange of information online, incitement to those activities online, we felt we've had to do something. So in September of this year, we've published guidance uh, guidance at this stage, we're, we're not yet moving to legislation of how we can improve, make more efficient, taking down, detecting, and, and removing content uh, that's illegal online. Um, just to look at the scale of the problem, and this looks like my kind of my inbox in the morning, how many emails I have to deal with, but in one second, that's how many <coughs> Google searches there are, 60, um, what is that? Yeah, 60 odd thousand searches in one second. Look at the number of uh, YouTube videos, look at the Instagram, look at the number of tweets sent, that's one second. Uh, so we also have to be very, very careful about the burden that we place on the platforms. Um, because there's, while uh, we need to push to remove content that's bad, or as we call it, illegal, um, there's a danger that good content can be taken down as well. And that the, the online platforms can over censure and say, right, if you want us to take down content, we will take down vast amounts of content, and you'll miss a lot of good content. Um, so there's this balance of kind of over-removal and under-removal. Um, you may be aware of something called the e-commerce directive, um, which, um, which basically sets out uh, rules for, for taking down illegal content. If basically a person or an authority notifies a platform, an online service provider, and says, hey, there's this really disgusting advert uh, or uh, maybe a beheading or something, you should, you should take it down. Uh, then there's a notification, there are rules on notification and taking it down. At the same time, within our guidance, we've, we've issued guidance on sort of Good Samaritan saying that, look, sorry, I just wanted to say that 
Um, if you take it down in time, if you take down the content expeditiously, you're protected under the e-commerce directive. You don't incur any liability. Um, and the problem is, is that if you have what's called active knowledge, so if you are aware of the content on your site and you don't act, then you're liable under the e-commerce the directive. So the platforms are in a difficult situation. They say, hey, you want us to take action, but if we take action, if we start looking into the content on our website and we take it down, we will lose our liability, <laughs> liability protection. We will lose our liability shield under the e-commerce directive. So we've developed some rules saying that, look, if you're a platform and if you, to your best endeavors, look for the dodgy or illegal content or nasty content on your website and you take it down, you will not forfeit, you will not lose your protection under the e-commerce directive. Now, one thing the platforms have told us, we do not want to be uh, the judge and jury on content. I mentioned the beheading, um, which is kind of a useful example as well. You may think uh, a beheading is, is horrific content. I certainly do. But then the human rights organizations say, well, look, if you censor all the beheadings online or if you remove them, then how can the people in Syria, in Iran or Iraq communicate the human rights abuses which are going on in their country? Because the internet is one of the few mediums where people can report uh, the crimes, where they can report the violations. So if the online platforms, I mean, there may be ways to cover it up and make the, the image fuzzy or unreadable, but if you cut off the, the means of communication of for example, human rights abuses uh, occurring in, in, in many countries across the world, then you deprive them of their air pipe uh, to, to explaining to the world and informing the world what's going on in their country. So this is an incredibly difficult balance to, uh, to, to strike. So we're working very closely uh, with, with the platforms before we come out with possibly very intrusive legislation. The last part of our, so I hope I've kind of covered platforms. I could talk about this for, for hours, but just give you an idea. We're taking action then for removal of illegal content, and we're trying to tackle the unfairness in the relationships between platforms and suppliers, platforms and businesses. The last part of our digital single market uh, midterm review uh, was a look at the international dimension. And there we talked about how important it is in Europe for us digitally, via digital, to talk about and explain and act on, on our core values. So open trade, fairness, fair competition, free data. We have to say these are our values in Europe. This is what we believe in. And uh, we want to project those values to the, to the greater world, particularly also free speech, data protection, privacy. Um, this is a debate we often have with the US. And we have these very, very strong uh, rules on data protection. They could not be more strong and many businesses don't like them, um, and particularly US businesses. And what we basically say is privacy in Europe um, is essential to our DNA. It's built into our DNA. It's an essential part of our DNA, given that many countries in Europe have, have, um, have suffered dictatorships, um, not only in Eastern Europe, but clearly in, in Western Europe from the Second World War onwards. And the privacy of data of the, in, of the individual, the risk of snooping, or the protection against snooping, that means looking into, in an indiscreet, in, in a very discreet way, uh, people's private data, people's perf personal data. The need to protect this must be upheld uh, at all costs. This is one of our core uh, values, and this is, this is a cost for business, I think we have to admit. Um, but the general societal benefit, we believe, is, is, is superior. Um, Another part we talked about in the, in the international dimension of the digital single market um, was the, um, the need to act for strategic investments. So very often in Europe, we fund technology through our funding programs called the H2020, Horizon 2020. Uh, we pump billions of euros into research projects, perhaps not, as, uh, not enough billions of euros into research projects in Europe and then we build this company, we build the technology, and along comes, for example, a Chinese company and buys it up. A Chinese company may buy it on the basis of its own state aid, of its own state-funded activities. And um, in Europe, we're taking another look at this, and we're saying, hey, is it really fair that our strategic investments 
can then be bought up by, by a third country. In particular, because we cannot do it the other way around. It is very difficult, if not impossible, for a European uh, company uh, to go and buy uh, a Chinese uh, tech-leading company. So we need to keep a very, very close eye on the strategic investments which are being bought up by, by third countries. Um, this is an extremely controversial issue, um, particularly in the, um, in the light of the, you may be aware of the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers released last week. Um, this is not an issue which we are going to uh, sort overnight. This is an issue, as you know, taxation is a national competence in Europe. It's not a European competence. Um, but what we're trying to get to in Europe is a fairer system of taxation uh, across Europe for not just digital platforms, but people who have, or companies that have a digital presence in another country. They make sales, make sales in another country, but they pay their tax. They may pay it offshore, or they may pay it in a country with very, very low levels of tax, taxation. And we're clearly talking hundreds and hundreds of billions of euros. Uh, what the European Union is doing is that we, want, we are trying to gather a common approach of how we're going to deal with taxation at a European level, at a global level, of, of large companies with a digital presence. Um, and we're trying to agree on our approach by the end of this year so that we can make a meaningful contribution to the OECD report and the G20 in April 2018. Clearly, this is a problem which needs to be tackled at best at a, a global level, not just a European level. Uh, but clearly, given the sizable activities uh, of digital players or companies with a digital presence in Europe, this is something which, which hugely affects Europe and there's something which Europe may want to act, may want to act on on its own rather than waiting for a global response. So that's a little bit of dot, dot, dot to be, to be continued. We have this thing every year called the European Digital Progress Report where we basically uh, take the temperature of progress in digital across Europe. We have five parameters, connectivity, like what's the level and quality of internet connection, um, the human capital, the levels of skills, the level that people are, are, are using the internet, how familiar they are with the internet, are they active um, users, are they passive users? Passive users means you know downloading your Facebook also means uploading pictures, but are you doing programming, are you doing coding? That's an active internet user. Um, how digital technology is being integrated into the workplace. Um, there are many companies across Europe who are actively engaging in Europe, many who are not. Um, and then how digital are the public services? Can you get your parking permits? Can you make your registrations online? Do you have to stand in a queue? There's a huge difference across Europe between the quality and speed and efficiency of, of digital services. Sometimes in some countries you can get um, I know in, in Italy, in north of Italy, which is one of, one of the more efficient uh, public administrations, that you can get everything online, but then you have to go into the administration and get the paper copy as well. So, you know, we question, is that, is that really, really efficient? Um, so these are the five um, parameters against, what, against which we measure progress in Europe. And it's a very small slide. I don't see, you can see where, where Spain is there. I've got a separate one, but it's, it's kind of in the middle uh, of Europe. You see Denmark, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, the, the north of Europe is right on the top there. Estonia is also very advanced, but also a smaller country, one million people, easier to scale up. And you've got Bulgaria, Romania, Greece, and Italy right at the bottom um, for, for, for whatever reasons. Um, but, um, and the European Union, so you see Spain is above the European, European average, but I mean, this is, this is um, you know, it's, even if you're in the middle, there's much, there's, there's much, work, much work to do. And um, we would like as many of the European countries to be very high up on all, all of the parameters quite clearly, if you're going to sort of stay in the game. Um, if, for example, you look internationally where we are in Europe on exactly those same parameters, um, this is South Korea, not North Korea, clearly. Um, we are lagging behind a number of the larger blocks, and just right behind us is Russia. I don't think it'll be very long before China will be overtaking us, particularly as they produce a million engineers per year. 
uh, Turkey and, and Brazil. Um, so that's just to give you an idea of where Europe is. Europe in the, these are very rough parameters. Um, we do go into detail, but they do give you kind of a, a fairly accurate feel of where we are, where we are worldwide. I mean, the U.S. is not just Silicon Valley. I mean, it's, it's Alabama, it's um, it's Oregon, it's, it's the whole country that we're looking at. Um, so there are huge differences and discrepancies within the U.S. So I was going to leave it there, possibly, because I don't know, in terms of concentration, um, that's probably quite a thorough account of where we are digitally in the European Union, um, both the state and where we are in terms of legislation. So if you want me to home in on any issues, then, then there we go.